My mission is simple, to make you money. I'm here to level the playing field for all investors. There's always a bull market somewhere, and I promise to help you find it. Mad Money starts now. Hey, I'm Kramer. Welcome to Mad Money. Welcome to Kramerica. Other people want to make friends? I'm just trying to save you some money. My job is not just to educate and teach, do a little entertaining, but put it in context. So call me at 1-800-743-CBC or tweet me at Jim Kramer. Let's not mince words. This is one of the worst days in the history of the stock market. A day where the circuit breakers got activated down 7%. A day where oil had its worst decline since 1991, down 24%. A day where the 10-year Treasury went below 0.5%, a record low, which tells you the bond market is terrified. It's also a day where you probably lost a lot of money. It's probably what happened to you. Uh, that's because, of course, the Dow plummeted uh, 2,014 points. It's worst point drop ever. S&P plunged 7.6%. NASDAQ noticed that was 7.29%. It's funny. I remember when the Dow Jones average was at 2014. Now it lost that much. Whoosh. So, okay, it happened. Don't like it? It happened. What the heck got us here? Where do we go next? First, today's sellers fear that we're going into a coronavirus-induced recession, and they're trying to get out of other people who want to sell. Just trying to get ahead of them. Now, that may sound fanciful, given that we've had less than 600 cases in this country uh, and only 22 deaths. In the end, it does seem to some like more of a super bad flu than the bubonic plague, yet all sorts of people saying all different things. As the, as the president tweeted earlier today, 37,000 Americans died from the flu last year. Yet, uh, quote, nothing is shut down. Life and the economy go on, end quote. But the markets were not reassured by that or anything else they heard today. Not the bond market where Treasury spiked with their yields sinking to frightening record lows. Not the stock market with its breathtaking breakdown. Not the oil market. That market down 24%. And that, that a lot of people fixated because that came out of nowhere. So who's right? the president or the markets. Was Trump correct when he told us that this oil price war between Saudi Arabia and Russia will be good for the consumer because it means lower gasoline prices, so we should be more bullish? Here's the thing. Cheaper oil would have been great for us a decade ago. But these days, the United States is the world's largest oil producer and an exporter. If prices stay down here, some of our producers will default in their debts and will end up laying off a lot of workers in the oil and gas companies, uh, the service companies, and the pipeline complex. Therefore, oil price may actually be more negative than positive and ripple right through the stock market right down to the banks. As for the number of people with COVID-19, sure, we've diagnosed less than 600 of them. But some of that's because we don't have enough test kits. And in some areas, they don't want to test you until you're very sick. Uh, not just running a 100 degree fever, for example, but very sick further along. I find that ridiculous. Americans won't take the positive aggregate number seriously until we get a better handle on this pandemic. Until then, they're not going to feel confident about going out or traveling, congregating anywhere. Even as we've seen a peak in Japan and China seems to have stayed lives, perhaps Singapore's peaked. It's only Italy, which just froze travel and seems pretty, I'd say, scary. And Iran uh, with who knows what. That's truly out of control at this moment. Now, when it comes to the sinking travel industry, uh, who wants to take a vacation when you see all these people on Carnival cruise ships getting sick? 700 of them in Japan is like two-thirds of what's going on in Japan was one, one cruise ship. By the way, it's bizarre that we aren't testing every person on every ship. And where are all the ships? Is that what do we have to keep waiting until they come to dock? we got to get our act together here. At least Dr. Tony Fauci, America's top epidemiologist, had the good sense to warn people away from cruises, although obviously the bad sense if you work at a cruise ship or if you're a shareholder, which you shouldn't be. These plague ships made it crystal clear that it's way too easy to catch the coronavirus. And the infected nursing home in Seattle proves that it's way too easy to die from it. If you're elderly, if you're sick ahead of time, that seems to be the population. Don't doesn't minimize it. Doesn't make it well. We don't have to worry. So what needs to happen to fend off a recession? Well, there are four things I really want to see here. And by the way, we get these four, and I'm not going to just fend off say fend off recession. I'm going to tell you to buy stocks, okay? But we need these four, Mr. President. We need these four. First, we need some serious fiscal stimulus as monetary policy is going as far as it can go. The government should be offering no interest loans to small businesses that won't be able to handle the downturn. They didn't do anything wrong. We should subsidize companies that give their employees paid sick leave because it's very hard to quarantine yourself if you're living paycheck to paycheck. Mr. Treasury Secretary Mnuchin, please stand up. You know exactly how to do this. You would comp the markets. Second, how about a change of tack from the president? 
No, he's got to hope for the best attitude. And that's a, the attitude my father always emphasized to me. So I'm not doubting it. Um, I also think, though, he should be planning for the worst, like my mom would have. We'd all feel more confident if everyone on a cruise ship is tested. Maybe test everyone coming from overseas or everyone in a big gathering or certainly everyone has a 100 degree temperature, for heaven's sake. I don't think this shows weakness. And it doesn't undermine the idea that things might be better than most of us believe. The more data, the more testing, the better we trust the figures. Credibility. Let me put it this way. The markets are craving leadership. And that's what the Dow and the tenure are screaming in unison. Playing golf is a way to placate and keep people going about their business. I mean, it's kind of like a keep calm, you know, keep calm, carry on thing. But going after your business during a, going after your business during a pandemic, it doesn't work. It, it puts people in danger. Now, we saw that during the devastating Spanish flu outbreak a century ago. We need to take a short-term hit here if we're going to contain this thing. Self-quarantine, work from home, stay away from the crowd. All this slows down the pace of the infection, gives healthcare workers a chance to breathe, which is what really matters. Third, we need the White House to push for a vaccine or a treatment or even just some better information, data, that would allow our scientists to solve this thing. Why not convene a Manhattan Project of the smartest minds from all industries? I know he's bringing in people tomorrow. You know, make them... Could make them commit to fixing this. Private industry, right? Hey, why not hand out big prizes left and right to anyone who can make some progress against the darn thing? $100 million tax free to the scientist who comes up with a cure. We give out a lot of money in Powerball, for heaven's sake. I mean, is this better use? Fourth, you go to war with the healthcare system you have, not the healthcare system you want. We need to back our community-based health system with unlimited resources, everything from mobile army surgical hospitals to ventilators and respirators and hazmat suits. State and local governments don't have the money to pay for these things. This is what the federal government's for. Why not do a gigantic bond offering? I don't know. Do a $300 billion 30-year that everybody wants so badly. Wish list aside, let's circle back to the big question. Can we start picking through the rubble after today's devastation, or is there more bad news coming that still isn't priced in? Look, I think we're on the eve of recession unless we get some major stimulus from Congress to restore confidence. And even that might not be enough because this is a public health problem. Remember, it's a biological crisis. The last time we were on the eve of the recession was December of 2018 when Fed Chief Jay Powell raised interest rates too far too fast, then promised us still more tightening to fend off non-existent specter of inflation and not as fine as they are. Back then, the stock market took a huge header. The S&P plunged as low as 2347. Keep that number in mind, 2347. Dow tumbled at 21,713. Those are useful benchmarks, right? And if we repeat that action, well, we could have a lot more downside. A useful benchmark, down 15% more for the S&P, down 9% more for the Dow. Now, those are extreme, okay? I, I, but I, I, there are going to be a lot of stocks that are valuable with it between here and there. I, we bought some stocks from my Chapel Trust. You follow along at ActionWorksPlus.com. We bought them right near the bell. Felt pretty good about it. All right, I've been bearish about this market for weeks now. A lot of people call me a panic monger. All weekend, I had to like, oh, my God, fear monger, fear monger, fear monger. Fear monger. I had to stop looking at Twitter for a while. I mean, like, you know, I, I'm not a panic monger. This, this, this is panic. I was trying to get you out of, ahead of the panic there. Uh, I do believe there will come a level where it makes sense to start buying even more aggressively. Two weeks ago, Warren Buffett told you to buy, arguing it's a mistake to try to time this uh, kind of market. It's the same call he made during the financial crisis. Back then, his call was way too early. Oh, boy, this time, too. But over the long haul, you did make a kill if you listened to him. And we might look back and say, hey, what was that Kramer thinking? He told us not to buy. I mean, well, you know, you can start buying now. The trust did. Here's the problem. You are not Warren Buffett. He's one of the richest men in the world with almost unlimited capital. He can even lose all the money he put into Berkshire, to, uh, that he committed Berkshire Hathaway to Occidental. Uh, he can afford to be early. The rest of us need a t- little time. they gotta, we got to get it better. We don't want to be overrun by sellers. If you want to sell until we get closer to those 2018 lows, I'm going to give you my blessing, especially for groups that are in the center of the blast zone, like the oil. Stay tuned. I'll tell you what's in the blast zone. However, we've got to be clear about one thing. This is not Armageddon. We have ridiculously low oil prices, good for the consumer, Mr. President. We have the potential for the lowest mortgage rates in history. If the Fed starts buying mortgage-backed bonds, those mortgage rates have not come down enough. The prices for goods and services are coming down. Employment's very strong. These aren't bad things. They're good things. And they'll ultimately allow us to spring back much harder than most people think we could. But make no mistake, COVID-19 is causing a slowdown, and it'll be very hard to spring back if there's no fiscal stimulus, no confidence in the government. That confidence doesn't come from hoping for the best and acting like it's business as usual. It comes from preparing for the worst. We need to make more coronavirus tests and get aggressive about administering them. We need federal money to bolster our local health care systems and subsidize the stuff we don't have enough of, like ventilators. Maybe we need more hospitals. Maybe more hospitals. Most of all, we need the White House to recognize the serious nature of the disease. Right? Bottom line, rightly or wrongly, people are terrified of this pandemic. It's very hard to be constructive about most stocks when the government's focused more on optics than on appropriate precautions. If the president wants to reassure the markets, he needs to consider a new approach. And if he takes it, call me a buyer. 
Mark in Florida, Mark. Oh, yeah, Jim. It's Mark from Miami. Yeah, what's shaking, partner? Everything's good. Thanks for everything that you do. And sure thanks trying. for talking me down off the ledge more than once. No, we don't. Yeah, but look, we, we stay together. You, you know, look, I've been mean, go read Confessions of a Street Addict if you want to see about why I said they got to, well, let's just say, talking off the ledge. What's up? As I stare Armageddon in the face, I just want to find a safe place to hide. What are your thoughts on Clorox, CLX? All right. Uh, first of all, it's not Armageddon, and we don't have to worry about it. I've seen Armageddon, by the way. It's got an uglier face. Uh, it, Clorox is interesting. Now, my travel trust sold some because we said we are being way too greedy. It's up way too much. I think it continue to go higher, but how can I tell you to buy some if we just trimmed a little? I think mean, you got to wait till it comes down. Hey, let's go to, um, ooh, here's an app, app name for what people did to the stock market today. RID in Massachusetts. RID. Hey, Jim, how are we doing? I am well. How about you? Oh, well, I know this story. <laughs> hey, Jim, thanks for taking this call. Uh, a quick question is, like, I have a Roku stock bottom on the last uh, ER, on the ERD, mm-hmm. at the 145, uh, and I had it, like, 2,400 shares. I'm holding it. I know it's, like, crushed. What do you recommend? And this is, um, it's Ro- Roku? Roku? Yeah, real cool. All right. yeah. You know, this is a problematic stock because it's a hot flyer. I had someone ask about trade desk this weekend, and that's another one, too. Now, the advertising revenue is coming down. Um, I do think that it's a good company, but I, I do feel also that it's a very high price to earnings multiple. Uh, if I had it here, I would not sell it at 96. I don't think I'd start buying it for another 15, 16 points uh, and then scale down. But I have not, candidly not been the best on the company, and I've said that over and over again. Uh, and I, I don't want to say I'm just not the call, but. There are other people who know this one better than I do. Or, or no, have been more right about it. Let's go to Lou in New York. Lou. Oh, yeah, Dr. Kramer. It's a huge honor to speak with you, and I truly appreciate all your help. Uh, everybody's honored to speak with I like speaking to everybody who calls in. What's going on? By luck, I happen to have bought Slack, ticker WRK, at its recent bottom and kept it to its recent highs because of your stay-at-home stock playbook. I was wondering if you thought it might be a good short-term play into this week's earnings. I thought it would be. Uh, you know, I thought it would be. I know it traded down to uh, 19 uh, in November, so we, obviously we can, it can fall lower. But I keep hearing this as the stay-at-home software company, and I, I like it. I didn't include it because it's been spotty, but it is kind of interesting and intriguing as I would look at it. All right, now, it may feel like it is, but I, uh, it's not Armageddon. Believe me, it's not Armageddon. We could spring back, but a couple of things have to happen first. And if they happen, we're going to spring because it's not the end of the world. And who knows? Maybe it's Singapore. Maybe it's Japan. Maybe we we will see some good news on COVID. But it might be too early to see that. On May tonight, oil prices are seeing their biggest one-day decline since the Gulf War. How far will oil prices drop? That's a big part of the mix. I'm going to give you my take on the space. Then after a historic day on Wall Street with stocks holding for trading minutes uh, after the open, following a 7% plunge of the S&P and the Dow facing its biggest point drop ever, I'm opening up the phone lines, taking all your questions. And with the Dow seeing its biggest percentage decline since 2008, yes, the Great Recession, I'm going to go stock by stock, helping you make some sense of the averages. So stay with Kramer. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Kramer on Twitter. Have a question? Tweet Kramer. Hashtag Mad Tweets. Send Jim an email to madmoney at cnbc.com or give us a call at 1-800-743-CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com.